Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Thursdays with Friends, our online conversation on current issues. I'm the show's producer, Wesley Wolf Fair Pinkham. I hope everybody's staying safe out there with this tropical storm and record heats. And I am pleased to send it over to our chat host for Thursdays with Friends, FCNL General Secretary, Diane Randall, and her guest, Amelia Keegan, FCNL's Legislative Director for Domestic Policy. Thanks a lot, Wesley, and hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm here at the FCNL office, and I just wanna share some exciting news about Washington, D.C. and your nation's capital, and that is that they're taking the fencing down that has been up around the Capitol since January 6th. Yeah, pretty exciting news. We're, it's gonna take a couple of weeks, I understand, but eventually it's gonna come down, and that's, that's good news. So we have a great uh, opportunity in the next half hour with Amelia Keegan to understand one of the, really the dominant issue that is going to be taking place on the Hill over the summer and an issue that is near and dear to our hearts. Um, I wanna thank all of you who've joined us today because you are close to FCNL, you are people who support us financially, you are people who take action and we are grateful uh, for that and we're really happy to be with you every couple of weeks on a Thursday. Uh, we have friends joining us on Zoom, on Facebook and YouTube. So here's the issue. As, as, as part of FCNL, we seek a world uh, with, there's a society, we seek a society with equity and justice for all. And we seek a community in which every person's potential may be fulfilled. And when we have uh, 14 million children living in poverty in this country, that cannot happen. That cannot happen. And so we have an opportunity this summer with legislation to change that dramatically. And Amelia is going to talk to us a little bit about how we do that. Um, throughout COVID-19, the systemic inequalities have become more and more apparent. And as we work to recover from the pandemic, we have to work for a society where we can end poverty and we can end also the injustice of how our tax system works in taxing uh, in, in, in not taxing people who have the greatest wealth and corporations have the greatest wealth. And we're going to talk a little bit about that too. This summer, lawmakers on Capitol Hill are crafting uh, legislation boosting the nation's response to the pandemic, the recovery efforts. But this legislation goes beyond only addressing pandemic needs. It really looks at some of the structural injustices in our economic system. We are focused especially in making two, uh, in two tax credit programs more viable, extending them for the next 10 years so they can have a meaningful, meaningful impact on the lives of children and families throughout our country. That is the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. So Amelia Kagan, who is the director of our uh, domestic policy team here at FCNL and who carries our economic justice portfolio has been highly engaged. She has been organizing with the faith community here in FCNL. She's been going to meetings representing FCNL. She is uh, in the midst of all the deliberations that are happening and the minute by minute intrigue of how we're gonna get this bill passed. So um, you know Amelia well, but let me just say that before she came to FCNL, she worked at Bread for the World for six years. Uh, Amelia is a graduate of Smith College. Uh, she's also a lawyer who has a degree from the University of Washington Law School. Um, and she is uh, an all around expert on these issues. Welcome Amelia. And can you start off by giving us a bit of an overview about these important tax credits and why they are so important? Thanks, Diane. And I just want to first just thank all of you for, for joining us. It's always just a, a joy to see your faces and uh, really just grateful for all that uh, you do to support FCNL, to support this work in so many ways. And I know for many of you for, for many, many years. So just really want to thank you all for um, all the work that you you have done, will continue to do, and and for joining us today, um, yeah, Ed, Diane, as you you were saying, this is a huge huge opportunity that we have before us, and you know we are talking a lot and focusing a lot about child poverty, but this the the legislation that Congress is kind of considering right now is about so much more, right? It's really about transforming our society and our economy, about getting us closer to 
uh, a country that, that really truly values the inherent dignity of every individual, that ensures conditions that really promote human flourishing. And one of the ways that is kind of Diane alluded to that we fall just so horrendously short as a country is when you look at the child poverty that we have in the United States, you know, that is the population, kids are the population um, that have some of the highest poverty rates in, in our country, particularly very young children. So we have, you know, one in seven kids were in poverty in, in 2019. That is pre-pandemic. And certainly for, for children of color, it's significantly higher, Black and Latino children, one in four and one in five, respectively. For a country with the wealth and abundance um, that the United States has, that should be just absolutely unacceptable. So, but Congress is considering this legislation that could do more to address this crisis than anything we've seen in recent memory. And so that I, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about kind of what Congress is considering, um, what's on the table and, uh, and how we can take advantage of this and make it happen. That's a great launch to the conversation. And, and we know that some of this is coming from the legislation that President Biden had proposed uh, shortly after uh, this new Congress took office and the Biden administration started. We had the American Rescue Plan that implemented some really important measures to address, to give pandemic relief. And we were very grateful to see that passed. And then we had these really mega, you know, mega bills and proposals that came forward, the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan. And I would say that within those two bills, there are so many issues that we care about. Um, we're gonna focus a lot on poverty today, but before the end of the half hour, we're gonna tell you a little bit more about what's in those bills and why they're so important and how we think that they're going to get passed. Uh, they're, they, there's, they're not, it's not a certainty at all, which is why your engagement is so important. Um, I gotta just say though, the, these numbers, I mean, sometimes we talk about poverty and people's eyes glaze over, but I, just, I think that, concept that so many of the poorest people in this country are children under five. Think about that, children under five. What if that was your child or your grandchild living in poverty? How would their life be different? And so let's talk for a minute about what these tax credits do that make a difference. How do they actually work in addressing poverty? Yeah, that's a great, great question, Diane. So um, the, um, as you alluded to the American Rescue Plan, uh, had made some really, really fundamental changes to the, the particularly the, the child tax credit, but also the earned income tax credit. But focusing on the child tax credit, um, basically what Social Security did to dramatically cut uh, poverty among seniors in this country, that is what this program will do for kids. Uh, those expansions are uh, projected to potentially cut child poverty in half this year. But the thing is, those improvements uh, only last one year. So they will expire at the end of this year. So we'll see this dramatic drop. But if Congress fails to, to take action, we'll see a huge spike in poverty next year. But basically what they did is, is it, it is essentially instituting a universal basic income for all parents. So all parents will, starting July 15th, get a check for up to $250 for every kid over the age of six and uh, six and over, and then $300 for every kid under the age of six. Um, that's real money when you think about it. So let's take a, a average family of maybe a, that has, say, a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a 10-year-old. Over the course of the year, that's $9,600. Think That's because it's $250 a month, right? I just want to be clear. every month. Yes. For each kid. Um, and then 300 for each kid, uh, younger kid. So yeah, over the course of the year, that's $9,600. That is, uh, you think about what that can mean for a family that is huge. And then if you think about, you know, if making these, these expansions permanent over the course of 10 years, that's $96,000, you know, give or take. So that, that's real, real money that can really make a difference for, um, for millions and millions of, of families out there. Yeah, I think that's really kind of uh, uh, awesome. I mean, when we think about it, it's, it is really one of those generational changes that could really um, kind of roll back some of the uh, antipathy that we've felt toward 
uh, welfare in the sense that, you know, that this, this is a good way to invest. I mean, that's what I like to think about this too, is that this is an investment. You know, we think about how, how important investments are to people's retirement. This is an investment in people's future and because it's an investment in children and families. And so I, I think that's just so compelling. So, um, Amelia, do you want to touch, where, where should we go now? Do you want to, let's talk a little bit about what else is in this bill that's important. Name a few other things, because I do think that there's so much in there. And then we'll talk a little bit about what the trajectory is of how, where this is going to go and how people can become engaged in it. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, the child tax credit provision, that's just one provision. And there is so much else in, in this legislation that they're considering. So we're really looking at major investments in kids and education, child care, finally establishing a federal paid family leave program in this country, pre-K, community college, universal broadband, addressing the climate crisis, investing in environmental justice, and then leadership is also working to get a uh, pathway to citizenship for DREAMers, TPS recipients, farm workers, and other essential workers. Those are just some of the things that are sort of on the, uh, on the agenda here that they're looking to include. These are things that you know, advocates have been working on for years. We're not talking about just uh, adding some money to some existing programs. We're talking about fundamentally restructuring kind of some of the, the fundamentals of, of how we treat work, how we support families, um, and how we build a society and an economy that's truly inclusive and truly uh, sustainable. Now, we've heard a lot in the news about this agreement on an infrastructure bill that happened already, but that's different than the American Jobs Plan, right? And the American Jobs Plan is the one that actually has a lot of things that we care about in terms of addressing climate change. Do you want to just name a couple of things that, are, that we're, we're tracking there? Sure, yeah. So, um, so as you said, it, uh, there are so many plans out there, but yeah, as you've probably read in the news, there's this bipartisan infrastructure plan. Um, uh, agreement uh, that they are trying to move. It is very uh, much more narrow. It is smaller. It is more traditional infrastructure, roads, bridges, those sorts of things. Good stuff, um, but that's kind of going to move along and kind of along. And then we also have this bigger package that will um, encompass uh, what folks are referring to as more human infrastructure, but some of the other things that are not captured in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure package. And so that's all of the, the care economy and as well as really looking at uh, some of the uh, addressing the climate crisis, investing in, in environmental justice, a lot of the things that they can't necessarily get into the um, into the kind of smaller infrastructure package. So that's moving along, but where we really need to, to where we're really focusing our energy right now is to ensure that this recovery package is as big and as bold as we can get it to really meet the moment that we're in right now. And how, and, and, and what will happen? I mean, will it be, I mean, how, what's the, what's the process? What's the timing? When are we likely to see action on this? Yeah. So that's a great question. I mean, the, they are, so to be able to move this recovery package, they're gonna use what's called the budget reconciliation process, which is a process that allows uh, Congress to move legislation that has a budgetary impact with just 51 votes in the Senate. And so it can bypass a, uh, a Senate filibuster. Okay, so, but in order for that to happen, you have to go through the actual, you have to uh, pass a budget resolution that sort of sets the parameters for this budget re uh, reconciliation bill. So what we're gonna see this summer is potentially before the August recess, they're gonna try and move a budget resolution that sort of lays out the instructions and the framework and the contours of what will be in this big recovery package. It won't have all the policy details written in there. We won't kind of see all that stuff, but all of that will sort of be baked into the framework in how they get to those numbers. So that's why the next, few weeks are really, really important to be contacting members of Congress, particularly leadership and uh, committee chairs to really be pressing that our, uh, our priorities are included and that this package is as big and as bold as this moment requires it. And then in the fall, we will see them actually start to piece out and really uh, write down the actual legislative text of all the specific policies that will go into this. 
Okay. So, so our action alert, which I, and I know we have one because we always have actions that we want people to take um, is something that I think we're going to put up now. And it, it is specifically, as always, we ask people to talk to your members of Congress, but um, this is really a, you know, I mean, I think this message once in a generation opportunity to fix our economy, it is once in a generation opportunity to fix our economy. It also is a recovery from both the pandemic and a recovery from a broken economic system. And so there are various ways to message this, but we have as always a, an action alert on our website. And we are in a bit of a, a campaign here where you're gonna be hearing more from us in addition to this event with, uh, with Amelia today. Um, Amelia and I participated in a webinar with other faith-based colleagues yesterday in which we're also working with, um, in addition to the faith-based organizations we work with, we're working with a lot of human service providers who work with social service agencies across the country who, are, who work directly with people who benefit from these programs to help them get access to the programs. And so it's a very big push and it's great to um, have a lot of partners that we work on with this. Um, we do have, have, we're willing to take some questions here. People have questions and um, I know that this, this question of reconciliation is, is a big one. Um, what, what kind of compromises, I mean, are we expect, are we likely to see, you know, I think that's really where like, and what for us, obviously we're really focused on this child tax credit and their income tax credit, but there are other priorities we care a lot about. You mentioned broadband, um, certainly some of the environmental justice issues, I think they might be in there, but also, you know, renewable energy. So there's so much. Yeah, there, there is a lot. I would say um, so the kind of some of the things that, I, to, to answer your first question of sort of where are we, where do we see some of the threats or where some of the compromises will be? Right now, the big question is how big? How big are they gonna go? How bold are they gonna go? What's gonna be included and what's gonna get chopped off the chopping block? And that's a, that's a, um, that's a really important question. Uh, earlier version of a budget resolution was leaked a few weeks ago from Senator Sanders, who is chair of the budget committee. That was a $6 trillion uh, that was a $6 trillion plan. Um, we've seen some other members of the Senate saying, you know what, that's too much. I, I don't want to go that big. And so there will be a huge effort to say, okay, how much do we really need? And what is really important that we, that we enact in this moment? So I think that is one of the big questions. And a big piece of that is, you know, how much of that are you going to offset? And that's a big question that comes to revenues, right? Because the more that we raise in the revenues, the more that we're able to, to, um, to be able to do on the spending side. Partly that's, a, that's just the mechanism of how the budget reconciliation process works. Everything has to be paid for and offset. But also um, it, it, this is also an opportunity to bring more fairness and equity to our tax code. You know, this is, this is a racial justice issue. The racial wealth gap in our country is, is astronomical. And our tax code may appear race neutral on its face, but there are policies within there that really widen the racial wealth gap exponentially. So this is also an opportunity to kind of tackle some of that as well. But Diane, to get to your point of sort of what are we focused on, um, we're focused on the, the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, as you said, the, the um, responding to the climate crisis and inv investing in environmental justice is another big, big priority for us, as well as ensuring a pathway to citizenship for DREAMers, TPS recipients, and other essential workers. There are other things like the broadband uh, access, particularly for tribes, is something that we're focusing on, and also making nutrition assistance more accessible to individuals who have felony drug convictions. These are all areas that we have been working on in our programs um, for a while. So um, there's a lot in there. And, and as you said, Diane, you will all be hearing a lot from us about ways to, to take action and how we need your voice on this. You, you know, and it's, um, I think the thing that can be confusing is that because um, we don't have like a bill number right now, right? And we're, we're trying to prioritize naming these issues so that Congress, the members of Congress and their offices hear this again and again and again by a multitude of people because um, this will be a mega bill and a mega process. And, you know, it, 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 like, I mean, the, there's not a discrete single action that someone's gonna take. And so the more that we can lift up the benefits of the child tax credit and the essential need for broadband across the country and the, the imperative for addressing climate change through this legislation, I think 
the, the better it will be, which is why, of course, we're going to keep asking people to be talking to their, their congressional offices. Amelia, a little bit on the side, one of the questions that has come up before because of this reconcili reconciliation process is a process that Congress has approved previously that goes outside the filibuster, which of course, you know, we, we support that as well, that, that this is a process that can be used. How does um, a pathway to citizenship, how does, how does DACA fit into that? Because the reconciliation process has to be about the budget, right? So, so how yeah. does that fit? So yeah, that, that is the main kind of restraint restraint of using the reconciliation process is it has to um, comply with what's called as the bird rule, which means every policy has to have a major budgetary impact. It can't be um, kind of a mostly policy, but really no, no budgetary impact. But there's a, a very strong case to be made that if you provide a pathway to citizenship, of course, that has huge budget ramifications for our federal government. And so that is the argument that um, immigration advocates are using. There is a precedent where um, an immigration policy was included in a previous budget reconciliation bill um, that ended up getting dropped at the last minute, but it seemed to pass the bird rule in that instance. So they're relying on that precedent. It's still up to the parliamentarian. So we don't know uh, mm -hmm. until the parliamentarian rules, but um, we are pushing with our, uh, with our coalition partners uh, on every front to try and make sure that a pathway to citizenship is included for as broad a population as possible. And if um, I, I want to turn in just a minute, I want to talk about um, the the revenue side, that what you're calling offsets. And um, but but before we, before we go there, um, um, I I guess I just want to say that I I think that this I mean just back to this notion of this being such a historic opportunity and the the absolute need for us to try to you know even though there it, it is massive to to try to push for all of these considerations because because there's a political reality here, right? Mm -hmm. That once, uh, you know, certainly by the end of the year and some say even by September, there starts to be a shift to the focus already about elections that are the term elections. And, um, and so we really need to get this legislation through as soon as we can this year. And it'll probably be the fall, I assume before, or, or, or do you think there could be action in August? Well, yeah, I don't, they will, we're hopeful that the budget resolution will pass before the August recess. You never know, things can slip, but the actual reconciliation bill, the huge recovery bill that will have all the, the policies in that, we do expect that to happen in the fall. It could drag out into, but it, it has to happen this year. Yeah, okay. Um, are there, what are the specific committees? Judy Hines asked us, what are the specific committees working on this? You mentioned the budget committee. Right, great question. So the budget committee is the one that writes the budget resolution that sort of sets that framework. But the reconciliation instructions actually go to each committee to write the reconciliation bill, and then it's combined into one massive bill. So one of the questions that we'll look at in that budget resolution is what committees get those instructions? If the Judiciary Committee does not get instructions, then we know pathway to citizenship is out. Um, uh -huh. We do expect most of the committees to have some sort of say over this reconciliation bill because there is so much that um, folks are looking to include. This is definitely where the action is, that's for sure. <laughs> Let's hope you're a member of Congress. Um, so Joe Volk put in a book, The Whiteness of Wealth, that I know uh, Stephen Donahoe and other people have been reading and talking about. But this gets to this question of like, where, where does the money come from? Who has the money to pay for this? Uh, because there, there is a concern they, you know, this is an expensive uh, bill. I mean, it will cost, will cost the federal government money. Um, but there is also a real movement to try to look at uh, a, a, a better distribution and fairness in how uh, taxation is done. And can you just, can you say a little bit more about that and what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm, I'm so glad that Joe mentioned uh, Dorothy Brown's book. I just really highly recommend it. She's been, um, yeah, certainly a voice on, on the Hill. Um, yeah, a lot of the proposals in, um, in President Biden's uh, plan to pay for a lot of these, uh, the recovery uh, legislation, um, really go to trying to make, bring more fairness and equity to our tax code. You know, our tax code, the way we tax wealth, income from wealth versus income from work is very different and continues to perpetuate kind of the uh, ability to uh, pass down 
massive amounts of wealth without necessarily having uh, uh, being taxed. And so that kind of perpetuates the accumulation of wealth from generation to generation. And certainly there are so many ways in which, um, as I said, within the tax code, it might seem race neutral from the kind of looking at it, but you look at how it is actually applied um, and it actually leads to just perpetuates the, the huge racial wealth gap that we have. So um, some of the debate is about what the corporate rate, the corporate tax rate will be, and some of it is also around individuals and the capacity to pass money along. And yes. obviously these are very contested. There's no decision on these yet either, right? No, and it's one of the areas where there's been some of the most pushback with, uh, among Democratic offices um, is how much revenue do you raise? Um, Biden's plan that he's proposed, they only affect kind of individuals making over $400,000, but um, but a lot of those proposals are, are still very contentious uh, relating to the capital gains tax rate, relating to step up in basis, which is kind of after someone um, passes, passes on, passing wealth, um, you get to kind of what that, what that amount is when uh, the heir takes possession of, of that capital. You know, one of the, we're about out of time here. We're going to have to wrap up. So I just I invite you to make a closing comment. But I, when I think about, you know, just back to the idea of investment, you know, and, and I mean, in some ways, what this does is it pays forward, right? It pays forward. And, and when you look at what, what difference does it make for a household to have that extra $300 per child per month? Um, and the fact is the research shows that it makes a big difference for families to have this, this kind of income. It, it, it addresses mental health concerns, it addresses anxiety, it addresses the capacity for children to graduate from high school and for, to go on and get jobs. And so there's just a, a, an enormous uh, benefit. I mean, there is, a, there is a cost to this, but the cost benefit analysis is hugely in favor of making the investment. So um, I, I really, I'm, I'm excited about the possibility of this and it's just, just very big legislation that um, I'm so glad Amelia that you are on the front lines monitoring for the monitoring this and helping give our network some direction in terms of what they can advocate for and also working at a bigger level with so many other organizations. We're really part of a, a system here to, to push this. Any final thoughts you wanna remark on before we close out? I would just er like, this is such a huge opportunity. It is going to take enormous, enormous amounts of work to get this done. Um, even when we get, you know, the 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 contours of the budget resolution out there, there are going to be constant pressures to try and make this smaller, continue to make compromises, and so we're going to have to push really, really hard to make sure that we get this as big as as bold to really meet the moment um, that we're in right now. And so, whatever you can do, we just, you know. Write your members of Congress, call them, write those letters to the editor, write those op-eds, get your neighbors involved, get your family involved. What, like, we need you, we need you. This is such a moment. And the only way we get this done is if there is a groundswell of um, voices from across the country who are really demanding it. And it's hard because like, there's a lot going on uh, in, in our world right now. And so we really, we just need your voices so much over these coming uh, weeks and months. So just thank you for everything that you do. And, you know, we are here to support you in your advocacy. So if there are ways that we can be helpful, you know, please, please reach out. We wanna help you do this work. Thanks, Amelia. Um, uh, I want to just note that, um, you know, we have, we always want to thank you for your, your support. Um, we just finished our fiscal year and uh, we had a big matching challenge and, and you met it. So thank you for that. Um, that financial support is as important as the advocacy. And I, I noticed uh, William Sweet sent a note saying concerned about what's in here for climate change. Believe me, we have not started on what really has to be done. There is so much more that has to be done on climate change. We are well of that, aware of that, and, and we'll keep pushing uh, full force to, to address that issue as well. So um, with gratitude to each of you for joining us uh, today and to Amelia for um, being with us, taking some time to be with us, and also for this advocacy work. Um, I want to say thank you on behalf of FCNL. Two weeks from today, uh, the director of our foreign policy team uh, will be joining us to talk about a really exciting project 
big, another big project. We don't take on anything small. This is another big project called Dismantling uh, the Racist Militarist Paradigm. And it is not about legislation. It is about an initiative and a narrative that we are trying to affect. And we'll tell you how we think it can affect Congress as well. So I hope you'll join us again in two weeks. Bye, everyone. <laughs>